Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the next in the series of the IEC's webinars. Uh, today, Josh McKenzie, founder of Development Beyond Learning, will be exploring the insights from employees in Asia, how they have been managing the impact of COVID-19, and how they have been supporting and developing the early talent. Um, if you haven't taken part in our webinars before, you can leave your questions in the question box um, on the software panel, just on the right-hand side. Um, just as we go along and I will be moderating these and then feeding them back to Josh at the appropriate time. Uh, also, we record all our webinars, so this session will be available on our website by the end of the day and you will also receive a link to the recording. Uh, that's it from me. Uh, over to you, Josh. Thanks, Marina, and hello to everybody. Uh, well done, um, and thank you for making the time uh, to listen to this live. And uh, if you're if you're listening to the pre-recording, uh, thanks very much as well. And obviously, a huge thank you to the ISC. Um, I was just making the comment uh, just offline earlier that uh, it seems the ISC has become a content uh, building and distributing machine at the moment. There's so much great stuff uh, coming out. So we hope to be able to contribute to that today. And uh, we do want some uh, interaction, um, and so, uh, as was explained, the question box will be uh, alive and well, and I might even go back to um, Marina throughout the session and see what's going on in there, and can we answer some questions kind of throughout the session, rather than kind of waiting to the end and sort of addressing them all um, on block. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Josh McKenzie, that's me. Uh, and I founded uh, some time ago a business called Development Beyond Learning back home in Australia in Sydney and uh, about six years ago. In fact, what's really cool about the timing of this webinar is that today is six years to the day that my family and I landed at Heathrow uh, with an 11 month old and six suitcases uh, to uh, bring the business over to this side of the world and see if we could make a difference in the UK uh, and Europe. Um, we think we've helped more of the future workforce um, uh, from a millennial type sense than anyone we know. Uh, it's our passion. We have a, a long heritage and, and, a, and a really strong commitment to early talent development, be they intern development programs, um, uh, graduate development programs, apprentice programs and the like, all the way through to new managers and first time managers. And we make a huge investment each year into behavioural change uh, using science and behavioural science. Um, into our first class trainers, uh, which are based in every region around the world. They're part of our team. We love them very, very much, a close-knit uh, close knit team. And into our kind of expertise and thought leadership and research into career transition. Uh, teams in Sydney and London uh, with those trainers and, and talent cohorts, early talent cohorts, um, in just about every uh, region now, um, uh, bar Antarctica. You wouldn't want to be uh, there at any time, I don't think. Uh, and so today, uh, we have been asked to kind of address what's going on under COVID-19 from a development point of view. And so today is around the like the training and development programs and schemes that you might put your early talent onto and tackling this question of uh, what to do with existing, uh, existing cohorts of people who are already in seat or on site now, as well as looking ahead to summer. Uh, we all know we've got incoming cohorts that are due to start in two months, three months, four months. So how do we how do we uh, approach that? And that's an issue uh, in the industry at the moment because what we know from uh, psychology is that human beings are hardwired to dislike uncertainty, and so that's why we're probably feeling uh, some pressure at the moment and, and and trying to navigate the ambiguity and trying to put some things in place as best we can. Uh, to bring to give ourselves a bit more choice, a little take take back uh, some control, uh, if you like, and think about the way forward. And so, in thinking about this session with the ISC uh, today, we thought, well, let's keep it simple. There's probably three main blocks that might be useful to spend time uh, looking at. The first one is a decision-making roadmap, and this has been pulled from two sources. One, our kind of observations uh, of working with early talent programs. Uh, in Asia uh, over the last, well, for many years, but particularly in the last four months, uh, because COVID-19 began impacting development programs in Asia around about Chinese New Year uh, in mid to late January. And that region and employees in that region have been um, adapting uh, ever since. And to help us with that section, 
uh, there's there's two things. There's a there's a model I want to show you, which we have adapted from a piece of work by McKinsey uh, in the last month or so, helping to, helping organisations and programs to navigate through COVID. And so we've adapted that model um, to use as a decision making roadmap forward from here, like into the summer and into next year. And then secondly, we have two really special and uh, cool guests uh, online with us as well. We've got Anna Champion, who is a head of early careers. Uh, and talent development at Jardines in Hong Kong, although uh, is calling in from Vietnam where she now lives um, this morning, but she's a head of, head of early careers at Jardines. Jardines is an enormous company that owns a multitude of businesses across, uh, across uh, Hong Kong and across Asia. And uh, they run a really great program uh, called the JET program, which I'm sure she'll touch on, and um, has been dealing with the I guess the fallout and the impacts of COVID-19 since January. The second person we've got dialing in with us to share some perspective is Gemma Hudson, who is a head of early careers at Salesforce uh, for the Asia Pacific. Uh, and in a similar position has been dealing with the impacts of COVID from uh, sort of January, February onwards, and has been thinking about this uh, maybe for a little bit longer than uh, the rest of us, but still battling the challenge uh, as well. So the second thing that we'll, we'll dive into is uh, potentially how virtual pre-boarding, uh, because this year early talent needs different and earlier support, uh, and your business can benefit from our businesses can benefit from increased speed to value uh, as well. So I'm going to touch on that and why that could be a really uh, useful lever to pull uh, over, particularly over the next two and three months, to smooth the transition and take back some control of of what that experience for the early talent is like and how your programs unfold. And then finally, we thought we'd wrap up with. What are some of the skills we believe early talent need now in 20? Now the game, uh, what, 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 are, what are the types of skills that are most important, particularly in a personalised and phased sense um, and based on the context and stage of, of the uh, talent journey uh, they, might, uh, they might be in. But what I'm going to show you next is the decision-making roadmap. There um, are a number of steps uh, to it and we will be walking through um, some ideas and thoughts about how you might be able to use this or, or a tool like it to help you navigate the ambiguity over coming months, um, over the next sort of three months, but then also looking like six and 18 months out. It is possible to do or possible to have a framework in place to at least help you, uh, help you do it. We'll be overlaying this section with some insights from Asia. What I want to say about uh, Asia as well, and I'm sure Anna uh, and Gemma would, uh, would agree, is that while employers in Asia have been dealing with this for longer, in some respects are a step ahead and in some respects are in exactly the same shoes as employers um, in the UK. In fact, yesterday, Singapore went back into lockdown uh, until I think June, uh, for example. I was flying back to the UK in late March uh, and through Hong Kong and I was on a a flight through Hong Kong and that was going to be the last plane into Hong Kong before it went back into some forms of restrictions uh, as well. So this issue hasn't gone away uh, in Asia. We're now facing second and third waves of COVID-19 uh, and so employers are really having to stretch and, and think about all right what is what is the way the way forward. But we, there are some insights uh, and some lessons to learn. So let's look at let's look at uh, let's look at this idea this decision-making roadmap. And the point of this is to really, uh, and why this could be useful, is to help identify some of the decision-making considerations uh, that might be worthwhile looking at as you decide your way forward on your own road into summer uh, and as your own road through to the end of this calendar year and into, uh, and into 2020. The first one is <coughs> resolve. It's quite short-term focus. We'll, we'll, we'll peel that back uh, a little bit first. The second one is to uh, return uh, to some delivery of, of development programs for existing and preparing for incoming cohorts. The third is to start to reimagine uh, and start to anticipate uh, what our programs might need to look like or even could look like uh, with, uh, with some innovation. The fourth is, is looking at redesign and, and fifth uh, reset. Um, and it's going to be interesting to, to hear from Gemma and Anna actually at what stage of this road uh, they believe they are at uh, at Jardines um, and Salesforce, um, and also peel back maybe some of the considerations and thought pieces uh, that will help us um, navigate our way forward as well. 
This is also a model you could use in other areas of early talent, but today we're just focused on the training and development uh, of your early talent. Uh, so resolve, this has kind of happened already. Um, this is about addressing near-term program continuity issues. Um, you may have probably have passed through this already. It was really that for the first one to four weeks following the escalation of COVID-19 uh, in your country, or for us, the UK. Um, but in Asia, that was around Chinese New Year back in January. Um, it was probably early to mid March onwards uh, in the UK. Uh, that kind of period, we're probably out of this period or maybe still a little bit in it, depending on your, your situation. And um, largely about managing or adapting you know, sort of the immediate development activities and events. I know in different parts of the world at this stage, there were decisions around uh, should certain workshops go ahead and company decisions being made. Well, we're not having gatherings any bigger than 20 or 50 or 500 or whatever it might uh, or whatever it might be. So just managing and adapting those immediate sort of one to four weeks of things that were things that were happening and information becoming available. There's probably also a lot of information sharing and communication across stakeholders, um, existing graduates and apprentices your leaders and managers and HR partners in the business, um, maybe your L&D talent development uh, colleagues, maybe your suppliers uh, and industry partners. So that's really the first, that first step is to resolve immediate and address immediate continuity uh, issues. Um, maybe you're still there or have you come out of it? Maybe you're in the return, uh, in the return phase. And this is really about developing a strategy to return to delivery quickly. Um, and for us, we think this is probably this initial three to five months through to and including the summer. It's really about saying, well, we are where we are. Uh, we don't know what the you know, next three months looks like or the three or six or nine months look like, but we need a plan. We have um, graduates or apprentices or interns expecting to start. We want them to start uh, largely. And so for existing cohorts uh, as well, this, this includes what experience we're we giving them and what support and ongoing development are we giving them. So for existing support, existing cohorts, sorry, this includes that ongoing development and also roll off. Uh, we're talking to a number of organizations at the moment around how do you help graduates roll off? They, they might be a year or two or three years in rolling off their program into this environment. So existing cohorts and also incoming cohorts, looking at things like pre-boarding and then starting to think now if uh, you're not already and put plans and make decisions about uh, onboarding. Secondly, taking lessons and insights from things that have happened in the past, COVID in Asia, financial crisis in 08, 09, 911, uh, and looking at what did, what did sort of successful programs and employer brands and, and companies in the early talent space do after those sort of landmark historical macro changes. Uh, and largely, you know, a number, a large number of them continued to invest in the development of existing cohorts and staying committed to their, uh, their the development of the incoming cohorts too. And that came down to two, uh, two uh, kind of factors when, uh, when we sat back and reflected on this uh, as well as one, it was the speed of certain things and the discipline around certain things. So the speed of pivoting in now, uh, in this environment, What's going to be important is the speed of pivoting training and development to virtual modes, which is largely happening or happened uh, at, uh, at the moment. If training is going ahead, it's being, it's being converted. Uh, our, I know our teams with our cl employer clients are super busy at the moment, converting everything over to uh, virtual, um, supporting leaders and managers to support uh, early talent. And this is particularly uh, important. One of the things we have seen in Asia is this sense of out of sight, out of mind, um, and the early career talent feeling maybe a bit disconnected because let's face it, the manager is under a lot of pressure. The manager's dealing with ambiguity, might have children at their feet, working at home in the spare bedroom or the attic. You've got a team of 10 or 12 or 15 or 30, um, and making sure that they are they have the tools and advice they need um, and are engaged in supporting the early talent this period and how quickly that can happen. And finally, they're the speed of communicating what development and support looks like now in this initial three to five, uh, initial three to five months. And then having discipline around, well, what skills and support matter most to aid a young person's transition to, into work, which we already know is a difficult one, but to aid their transition to work uh, in a much more complicated, ambiguous, and largely ice, potentially isolated and remote 
uh, working uh, environment. And finally, discipline around the expectations that we're setting with stakeholders, including the early talent uh, themselves. I think that discipline is going to be really, really important, not just the speed of response and putting a plan in place for the next three to five months, including onboarding, but the discipline around what are we focused on, what's going to add the most value, what expectations are we setting, and what support are we putting in place. We've got to remember that uh, if you've got with graduates and apprentices uh, in seat now, existing cohorts, like this is their financial crisis, or this is their 9-11. They haven't had something like this before. A lot of the rest of us know that this too shall pass. This is a, um, you know, it's, it's a moment in history and it will pass and there will be a return to some form of normality. We will get through this. But if you're 18 or 19, or even 21 or 22 or 24, you know, you were barely born when September 11 happened and you were kicking around primary school when the financial crisis happened. Like this is your what on earth is going on moment. The, the moment in the world that it says, right, wow, the world can be really something, something fierce. Um, what can I learn? This will, this will be quite formative for these existing and incoming cohorts in their lives as they make this transition at that time. So that us having speed and discipline around our response to their development over the next three to five months, so important. And the next step is to, um, will be, I guess, if, if you haven't started already, and um, the next step could be in the roadmap to reimagine the next normal and how it might look. Now, this is where we start to get into uh, maybe having a bit of fun with the ambiguity uh, and uh, without trying to be futurist or having a crystal ball, um, I think there's a general consensus across most industries and ours that we won't go back to exactly what we used to do. There will be some, some elements uh, that we will and some elements uh, that we won't. But reimagining now, I think, is rethink is thinking about six to, six to nine months through to the end of 2020. So I've got through the first three to five. We've onboarded. What do what the six to nine months look like for our existing cohorts and their ongoing development and support? but also our incoming 2020 cohorts and their ongoing development and support. Some great questions to be asking here is, what in your development strategy might you reinstate? As in, you'll actually go back to doing it because it worked and there's no reason why you can't continue to do that. And it has, a, and has value and ROI um, and um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a great element of your strategy that you want to reinstate. Another question would be, what might you reinvent in the new world? It might be how you deliver a certain element of your development program or how certain support is provided. What might you reinvent? And then what might you not be ready to make any sort of thought about or decision about just yet and you want to revisit? And maybe you don't revisit that until um, October or November or December um, or early next year. But in reimagining three simple questions around what do we think we might reinstate? when things settle down a little bit, what might we reinvent when things settle down a little bit, and then what we don't necessarily need to talk about now, what might we uh, revisit when things uh, settle down? And think about that six to nine month timeline through until the end of uh, 2020. With the focus for now probably being back on, uh, back on a return over the next three to five months, giving yourself some space to think, yeah, okay, but after that, like what is a medium term idea of where we think we'd like to take this. Uh, stage four, redesign, um, which is really about under these circumstances, creating a flexible new approach to development. Not just a new approach and not a new approach for the sake of it, but a flexible uh, new approach. And this is uh, really, really important uh, so that you have options. We don't know what the world will look like in six months time. So you need to, we need to put ourselves, you need to put yourself in a position with the development program that you have options. Uh, there's no decisions without options on the table. Um, and this flexible approach, this flexible new approach needs to take you from sort of six to nine months through to the 2020. Um, it's what maybe you've reimagined in the previous stage of your existing in 2020 cohort. Um, and in, in an approach that will give you options as the new world unfolds, on those things you might reinstate um, you need, might need to uh, have an alternative backup plan to move quickly to something else if what you wanted to reinstate from the old world isn't actually going to work six months from now. For those things you might want to reinvent, ring fence pilots are so valuable. So we're going to reinvent this, but we need to test it and learn from it first 
running some ring, ring fence pilots virtually you know, over the next few months, super, super, super valuable. Uh, and then those things that you want to revisit you know, in six months time to keep those on your agenda, keep those on the table as they may actually pop up. You may find yourself in a circumstance that the things that you did want to revisit, it's time to revisit uh, uh, now and they actually prove really, really valuable to do so. Um, in creating uh, that sort of flexible new approach, it's also important to minimize risk while also innovating. Uh, minimizing risk helps get stakeholders on board, particularly while there's ambiguity and people are hardwired to dislike uncertainty. So a, uh, any sort of flexible new approach needs to be able to minimize risk and you need to be able to show that. Uh, but also you need to be innovating as well. And we can do that by doing three things. We need to lean on behavioral science uh, to better predict what might work and um, how people respond, um, how they feel for their psychological needs, what we can be doing uh, by setting up the, 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 the right sort of choice architecture in our development programs, particularly virtually, um, and what we can be doing to support that behavioral change on the job is going to help us better predict what might work. The second one, is around staying connected with peers in the industry. So sessions like this, I hope the ISC is able to keep producing the sheer volume uh, of connectedness and content that they are at the moment. I think it's great, uh, but we don't need to rely on them either. Staying connected with peers in industry to see how things are folding out, unfolding. And then also looking outside the early talent industry for, for cross industry uh, innovation uh, as well. I wanna tell you about um, one of a cross industry innovation that we're applying in our own business um, at the at the end of this uh, session under the circumstances uh, that we are under. The last the last stage here is to reset um, and that is to launch and learn in the new world. Not to lunch and learn, uh, like lunch and learns will still be important. But <laughs> this is launch and learn in the new world. And the learning is so, so important. What I mean there is launch, test, learn, adjust to really take a, an agile, and design thinking approach uh, is going to uh, matter. And we're really thinking now about three to 18 months out. I would be spending the um, least of your time here at the moment. Um, and, uh, but again, it's about thinking, well, how can we set ourselves up? How can I set my development program up for my existing and incoming cohorts to take back some control, provide some certainty, given everyone's hardwired to dislike it? to dislike uncertainty, how can we take back control, put some things in place that give us some options, and then take a phased approach three to six months at a time as the new world unfolds. And they don't need to commit to kind of, this is what development's gonna look like for the next two years. You don't know that, uh, and neither do we. But this phased approach over the sort of six months at a time is gonna be really, really valuable. Um, and also listening to the data and the feedback is going to continue to be paramount. Um, and again, Keeping in mind, what in your development strategy might you reinstate, uh, reinvent, um, and keep uh, keep under review? And there'll be lots of things under each of those each of those uh, three. Uh, so that's the kind of roadmap, um, if you like. I'm now going to throw it over for some comments uh, and an Asia kind of perspective. Uh, the first person I'm going to throw over to is Gemma Hudson. Like I said, she is uh, Gemma is. A wonderful human being has been in the industry for um, a long time and uh, started off in Australia, has done some incredible roles in Singapore with various organizations, is now at Salesforce, uh, very, very passionate. Um, and for a little bit more of a human touch, I thought we'd put the LinkedIn profiles up rather than a, you know, a straight corporate shot. Uh, so I hope that helps. Gemma, I'd like to um, throw to you. Can you uh, hear me okay? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? I can. Welcome. Thanks for joining. I think it's uh, dinner time uh, with the kids uh, otherwise um, engaged. Is that correct? Yes. The kids are with husband and I'm locked in my bedroom of all places um, chatting to you in the UK tonight. <laughs> like we all are. I wouldn't worry about that. Um, so, yeah, Gemma, just, just really thank you so much for joining us uh, in your evening um, and dialing in from the other side of the world. Really keen to get your perspective. Um, and we've talked a, we've talked a fair bit, um, and I know you've got some points you, you, you'd like to go through. So yeah, take it away. What's what's your view of of the world in in Asia since January, and, and where you think we're heading, and, and what can we do? Sure. Well, look. Thank you so much for having me, Josh. And I've just been sitting here, sort of listening to um, that 
roadmap and just contemplating how it applies to the situation that I find myself in. And I think here for me in, in Singapore, and I'm fairly sure that Anna will echo this as well, it, it feels like we're actually, we get to, you know, sort of, we go through stage one, one and we get to stage two and maybe we even might get to stage three and then you go back to stage one all over again because there's a new measure that comes in place. There's an escalation of cases. Um, you're looking after several markets. So I look after ANZ, I look after Asia um, and I look after India. Um, so we've been on different pathways or different parts of that roadmap. Um, along the journey and so you might be in one stage of the roadmap um, in one country um, certainly in Australia we're we're looking much more at at the return um, sort of phase whereas at the moment we've gone back almost to the resolve phase in um, in in Singapore um, because we've just had notification that we are now going to be in complete lockdown until the 1st of June. So you then have to go right back to the beginning and, and go back to that communication. Um, and that's kind of okay. Well, the things that we thought we might be able to do, we now need to, you know, re-communicate, rethink and, and completely um, redesign again. So it, it's been a real roller coaster. Um, as Josh mentioned, we've been dealing with this now since uh, the middle of January. The way that it played out in Singapore, uh, is that it was uh, the awareness of the virus started about a week before Chinese New Year. And until I moved to this region, I didn't understand the uh, significance of Chinese New Year. It is huge. There are millions and millions and millions of people um, uh, traveling across the region over that time. And so Singapore really didn't have a lot of time to make some decisions about putting in measures to prevent that. But Singapore being Singapore, um, they did a pretty good, great job. Um, and so the one thing that we've had probably in this region a little bit more than perhaps the UK to manage this situation is time. We, we have uh, probably had incrementally been dealing with this situation rather than um, uh, sort of having a massive hit all at one time. We've been able to deal with things and adjust to things in a more incremental fashion than perhaps some parts of the world have been able to do. And I think, you know, on one hand, that can be easier from a, a graduate manager point of view because the smaller adjustments are easier for the human um, sort of psych to accept and, and to become used to and, and uh, um, uh, you know, be okay with. Um, uh, and so for our graduates, particularly in Singapore, it has been a much more gradual adjustment. Whereas those in ANZ and in India, it's been quite an abrupt uh, halt to their normal activities. Uh, they'd seen, we certainly experienced in Singapore that, you know, we, we saw Europe and Australia and, and the US watching us kind of going from afar, kind of going, oh, you know, you're dealing with that over there. That's really bad. You know, sorry for that. Uh, to then, you know, very abruptly having to support those those markets deal with it. So we've, I, I've got a, uh, my Singapore cohort actually is fine. They, they, or my Asia cohort is actually fine. They've been able to incrementally deal with this and I've been able to do the same and manage stakeholders accordingly and make um, fairly, uh, you know, what, um, informed decisions along the way. Whereas India and ANZ have been a little bit more difficult and ANZ has been particularly difficult given that they were brand new on, this, on the 3rd of February this year. So that's been a real challenge um, in, uh, getting them onboarded and appropriately supported in their first couple of months at work. Um, I think the only other thing that I would say is that um, one of the things that we're that I'm certainly experiencing, and I think that graduate managers need to um, appreciate, is that we're also experiencing this. So our, our priority is to manage the business. Our priority is to manage the graduates um, and their well-being and their onboarding. But we're also experiencing this ourselves, whether it's personally and professionally. Um, and it's taking its toll. It definitely is taking its toll. So I'm definitely finding one of the good things about this experience um, out here is that people have become a lot more human and people have become a lot more authentic. And today, just today, I've got an example where I actually had to say to a grad in Australia, 
I actually need to keep my energy for me today. Um, I'm very lucky. I've got great relationships with my graduates. And um, I you know, said, look, I can't do our one-on-one -on -one today. Could we please do it tomorrow? And I think we really need to view our roles as, as you know, the custodians of these amazing talent and these amazing individuals and the connections with the business and, and all of that. You know, we also need to maintain our own health and well-being um, as well, and I think that's really important. Josh, I don't know if that sort of covers. Yeah, that, the topic yeah thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I guess my the the sort of one overall question is: Is Singapore's kind of under control when you look at um, um, India, which might have you know things maybe hit a little bit later um, and maybe had less time? Would you say there? You're reimagining now. Are you still at your return or reimagine? And what's been the one thing, the biggest thing you've learnt um, managing India um, and the fallout? Yeah, look, I, I, India is a real challenge at the moment because all of my grads have access to to internet, but it is patchy, um, and and so you know we have had to. Uh, work with individuals to support them. I mean, we were absolutely lucky. We work for an organization that will, um, you know, we had a 250 US dollar um, grant to every employee across the world to set up a home office. Um, and so that really, that that made a big difference in, in India for sure. Um, I had my India team meeting this afternoon. So I caught up with all of my Indian team. They are actually surprisingly upbeat um, and, and doing really, really well. They are at the end of their program, so they've only got two months left to go. The biggest impact for me and jo uh, Josh in India is actually that the rest of the business doesn't stop. So to add to COVID, we had a major business restructure at the beginning of February. And that meant that these individuals, when lockdown happened and they all got shipped home in India and some of them went back to their families, They'd had a pretty tough six weeks. They'd lost colleagues. They'd been, um, you know, put into different teams. Their mentors on the program may um, have been in different roles. They lost their manager. And so we're actually managing multiple um, situations in, in India. And, and to be honest with you, that that is what has caused the most complexity in India as opposed to um, I guess the, the COVID situation um, on its own. The only other thing I'll just say about India is that I'm fully expecting that I won't get to meet my graduates in India, certainly not for another possibly 12 months. I, I really don't believe the situation is gonna be able to be under control with the infrastructure they have there for a very long time. And I just don't think that countries around the world will allow um, uh, people to travel there for, for quite some time, which is, it's really devastating on a, on a, on you know numerous fronts. Um, yeah, so that yeah, India India is a topic that I could talk about all day. But I think you know I think the biggest thing for us in India is probably more so that we've also had a a major restructure happen, which you know on top of the COVID has has really created a a bigger challenge. Great, thanks, Gemma, and particularly for others on the call that may also have colleagues managing um, graduates in India and other parts of Asia. Um, or, or some of their own graduates uh, um, and, and early talent in India. That's uh, that's really that's really really insightful. Thanks thanks so much, Gemma. I might come back to you a little bit later if we've got time uh, as well. Um, Anna, can you hear us? I can indeed. Excellent. Anna's dialing in from Vietnam, where she uh, lives at the moment. But as I said, is the head of early careers at Jardines, uh, which is a large, con enormous conglomerate uh, headquartered in. Uh, Hong Kong with uh, early talent around uh, the whole region. Um, similar fashion, Anna, um, uh, you know, we've been talking about COVID uh, with you since January. Uh, there have been impacts on programs. Uh, what's What's been your perspective? What has been some of the lessons and insights? Where do you think your um, JET program is on the roadmap um, and what, what can we take away? Sure. So, I mean, we were already on a journey in terms of our development program and working with DBL, fortunately, um, from the beginning of uh, the year. So um, we've been sort of redesigning everything as well. Um, Jardines is um, a, a very old um, institution that's been around for many, many centuries and still family run. Um, and it's got about 450,000 employees. So it's a sizable business. 
Um, and based around that, um, you know, we've, we've been really trying to, to kind of move forward, I guess, as a whole um, with kind of looking at learning across the group, our high potentials, our important many, and kind of the functional academies, uh, of which JET is one small part. Um, the, the JET programme, um, in terms of where we are, I mean, it's... it's our jets and our headquarters is in Hong Kong, so we've been going through a roller coaster of uh, all sorts of different things related to political unrest as well for, for many, many months before even COVID hit. Um, so you can only imagine the, the experiences that we've gone through in terms of uh, looking at <laughs> where we are. Well, in fact, uh, Josh, Josh and his team all know about you know, what's been happening. Um, but I think, um, as, as you said, Josh, we, um, we hit very early in terms of COVID. I mean, even before it really got to Hong Kong. Um, and you have to remember that in Asia, um, SARS is very, very recent for, for them. And so they think um, a little differently and they're a little bit more conservative in terms of the approach and, and maybe have um, a bit more foresight. So even in um, early February, in comparison to Singapore, um, actually, there was a work from home policy that went very, very quickly into our businesses. Um, and as Gemma said, we then um, released it and people ended up going back into work and then suffered a second um, uh, wave of it. So I guess like, if I look at the programme and I look at the model that you had, Josh, I think we've been through um, a number of different stages. Um, in terms of resolve, that happened kind of very early in our programme. Um, with postponement of courses, it wasn't safe for us to bring people together, even if um, it, it looked relatively okay um, in, in the environment we were in. We were worried about bringing in external um, uh, development partners, and also a lot of our, our jets are uh, positioned around all of Asia. So um, very early on, we took a decision across the group to, um, to kind of postpone courses. Um, and then if I look at kind of the next part around return, I guess that then became unsustainable to keep postponement. Um, and with the kind of current model of, oh, it's okay, we'll do it in a few, mo few months but, um, and, and we'll see how we are. And, and a lot of times we were waiting to the last minute to make those decisions as well. And so I think at that point we, we worked with, um, with DBL and, and with um, our other um, learning and development partners to try and figure out a way to kind of change the way in which we delivered so um, we we added in more virtual classes um, and then we started to see how they were were received and I think for that um, I, I think that really um, gave us a lot of insight into how we engage people I mean it's a really weird scenario for me I've got young children who are seven and nine have been homeschooled since February um, the beginning of February. So, so in the UK, with your with a few weeks under your belt, um, you know, by the by the time that we've kind of got to April, uh, so we we've definitely gone through quite a lot of learning around how um, virtual classes can be um, can be delivered in for, across all age groups. And I think that was one thing that sort of we looked at. Um, and sort of kept um, pivoting around how we were delivering it. The engagement actually went up quite a lot at the beginning. Um, I think when people were really keen to, to hear other people's voices, but then um, over the time, it's been a very stressful time for people in our businesses. Um, we have um, a lot of, um, our, our, we have the Mandarin Oriental, um, in, in our group, um, so the, the hospitality industry, we have the air, uh, parts of the airline, airline industry, um, and we have um, restaurants and supermarkets. So some people were being pulled upon to be working all hours to resolve um, issues in terms of supply chain and other people and, and how to deliver food in a different way. And other people were, you know, were basically um, being um, underutilized and so there was a there's a lot of different scope there so I think that was that was that part and I, I, I guess that then really moved us into the reimagine stage um, and I think we're sort of somewhere between reimagine and redesign at the moment um, as a group um, we turned about a couple about a couple of months ago we started looking for the silver lining as we called it of development so you know where were the opportunities that we had um in in the in the scenario and how do we how do we turn things around so we actually um 
sped up some of our programs that we were looking to, we're just about to embark on a big launch of EdCast across our business units. And some elements of that we, we sped up. So in terms of wellbeing and development, um, uh, development programs that were, were, were in the pipeline, we, we accelerated. And we used it, as you talked about, um, Josh, a bit earlier, we're, or we are using it as a bit of a, a, a kind of pilot around kind of getting people involved and interested at a lower cost um, than, than it would be in the longer term. Um, and then for the JET programme itself, we, um, we really started to look at what this means in the future. So I um, introduced um, SEMA qualification, which would come a bit later in their journey. I, I accelerated that. Um, we also accelerated our on-demand coaching um, initiative, which basically gives our Jets some um, individual coaching sessions when it matters to them. And we felt that this was something that was some, it was easily um, introduced earlier and they could um, manage it themselves. And, and back to your kind of point about behavioral science, it would allow them to, um, it would allow them to be able to really engage in their own learning. Um, so I guess we've we've done quite a lot there, and then and then actually um, I think we're as I say I think we're somewhere on the way to redesign. And in fact, we were having conversations yesterday around what would this look like moving forward. What does it mean in terms of not just September, but the whole way in which we 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 deliver our learning? Um, were there ways that are every, everybody's under cost constraints? So are there ways that some of this may have cost and efficiency and benefits for us, but also continue to deliver the learning that we need to at this point? Um, I've covered loads there, Josh. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Annie. You have you have covered loads, Thank, and and Gemma and Gemma also. I think um, so some of the big themes that are that are coming out though is different markets on different parts of the journey you know Australia compared to India compared to Singapore they're not at different they're not all necessarily at the same um, uh, stages um, and and also something's really coming out <clears throat> something that's really coming out for me is that to um, reimagine and redesign is possible you know it's, it's happening uh, already and I, and I think in markets like the UK and Europe <clears throat> and the US sometimes at, at the moment reimagining and redesigning at this point or even beginning to think of that when you've got virtualizing internships and onboarding and current cohorts to think about might seem a little insurmountable uh, at the moment. There are there are organizations in Asia already already well and truly into the reimagine. I, I would say the JET program is, is definitely into the reimagine um, phase and I know there have been, been discussions this week about redesign uh, as well. So I think it is where we're heading and, and it is possible if we just little bit at a time, a uh, little bit at a time, the questions we, we posed sort of earlier take back a little bit of control, wipe out some of the ambiguity, give ourselves some options, have backup plans, um, ring fence pilots, et cetera. There's, there's definitely some agile ways uh, that, we can, uh, that, that we can move. I'm just very, um, very keen to get on to um, the, the rest of the content. So I'm gonna hold uh, Anna and Gemma there. Um, Ma uh, Marina, are there questions in the question room? Yes, we have a question from Edward. Uh, what do you think the key lessons from the from behavioral science might be for L and D? Great. Can we? I'm mean, that's, that's the like the, the best planter question I think I've been given uh, in three webinars I've run in the last twenty four hours. And um, I'm going to cover that. Uh, let's let's address that uh, right at the end. And um, we might actually end up taking questions on block um, at the end uh, as well. So that, who who asked that question? Uh, Marina? Uh, Edward Walker. Thanks Edward, we will come to it. Um, the second the second stage, uh, the second step I guess to talk about this morning is how virtual pre-boarding helps uh, because there's a I guess a consensus building uh, in the industry that uh, this year early talent needs different and earlier supports. So this is particularly beginning to think uh, and relevant to your incoming cohorts that are due to start uh, this coming uh, summer. Some pre-boarding examples uh, might include you know, basic keep warm strategies, electronic communication, uh, etc. That's kind of par for the course, has been for years. Uh, but pre-boarding examples might be digital learning uh, that you enrol your incoming cohorts into, uh, virtual, you know, live virtual masterclasses on certain skills or certain elements of your onboarding program. Hey, why wait until July uh, or September? Why not start drip feeding that uh, to them now? So be it organizational uh, information, if that's relevant and possible, 
um, but also uh, development opportunities, virtual classes, etc., around certain human skills, maybe even technical skills that could just start to uh, do a few things uh, delivered virtually uh, or, or digitally. And those few things would be three, I uh, guess, that sort of come to mind in terms of how pre-boarding can help. One, you can start to reduce some of the cognitive load that your incoming cohorts will be experiencing now, and they will be experiencing it. This is their 9-11, this is their financial crisis. They are making an already difficult transition to work, made even more difficult now with this ambiguity ambiguity, ambiguity um, and, and complexity that's going on. So reducing some of the cognitive load, taking some of the pressure off for you, the onboarding experience, spread it out. Number two, um, it increases speed to value once they do start uh, by aiding uh, competence and connectedness with their peers uh, in the business. Some great things you can do in pre-boarding around connecting them with their peers. We used to do this socially. Uh, your employees would take take grads out on social events or run drinks and they get together a few months before they start or a month before they start. We can still be running team building exercises virtually. We can be running uh, development sessions virtually that connects them uh, with their peers and also gets the business involved as well. It increases their speed to value. They're already connected. They're kind of on the front foot. And then the third one there uh, provides additional support amongst the, amb the added ambiguity of COVID-19. Uh, as we say, uh, if I was, if I know, you know, I, I joined my grad program, I, I accepted my offer a couple of months before September 11, started after September 11, and I remember thinking in those six months, like, how is this going to play out? Uh, does my employer remember me? What's going on? Um, I haven't heard from them very much. And then they started drip feeding content and experiences and opportunities uh, to do that. It made a massive difference. That's what the, that's what your incoming cohorts are going through. Uh, right now. So think about pre-boarding uh, as a strategy to remove some of the uncertainty um, and uh, support uh, your talent at this at this time. I want to finish up on some uh, a view on some of the skills that early talent need uh, in 2020 and thinking about this in terms of a personalized and phased approach. Um, context is king. So if you've got grads in the UK but you've also got grads in Italy and Spain and France versus grads in, say, the north of Europe in Germany or the Netherlands or the, even the, the Nordics. Context is king and so is the stage of the talent journey uh, that they are at. But some skills uh, uh, for the pre-boarding stage, adaptability mindset, resilience, uh, self-management, how am I going to manage myself either remotely or if we are on site in an office together at some point. Um, what does my personal brand need to look like? How do I build that? Maybe physically in an office or on site, but, but also maybe remotely if we're still in that scenario. How do I collaborate? Just helping this, this early talent to get a little bit ahead uh, in, in terms of um, what's going to be required and how they can really um, you know, make a difference and, and smooth that transition, but also to help build their confidence uh, uh, in, in, in transitioning during this time. Um, skills for helping early talent thrive through uncertainty. So this might, these might be the types of skills you would think about for your existing cohorts and your existing grads, your 2019 cohorts, for example. Again, adaptability mindset, are you taking charge of your career during change, remote self-management, remote personal brand, uh, remote teamwork and collaboration, um, remote EI um, and social intelligence. And um, let's not forget that your our, our existing cohorts may have only started last September or last July. They're still making their transition. Uh, they're still finding their feet. They may only be in their first rotation. Maybe they've only just started their second rotation and now they're at home and can't talk to anyone. Uh, so skills for helping early talent thrive through uncertainty uh, look, look uh, like that in that sort of vein. So what are you doing? What can you do? What can be provided? This might help to um, return or reimagine some of your uh, development over the next three months to sort of five months. And then skills for helping early talent have an impact. So skills to really think about for early talent to really think about how to make a difference during COVID-19, not just survive, whatever, but actually, but actually make a difference, particularly uh, to uh, other people. Um, we think of probably these, these five. Growth mindset, really identifying fixed and growth mindset right now uh, when things are uncomfortable and, and a bit unusual um, and difficult. 
um, adaptability in terms of how they adapt their, not just their mindset, but actually their, their approach to their role, how they might be able to pivot in their role and create new value um, and new ways of, of adding value to the team and adding value to their manager. Care, which is around self-care, helping, helping grads and, and interns and apprentices apply everything they know right now about physical health, mental health, emotional health, uh, so they can look after themselves, so that they can be their best selves. I think managing up is such an important skill uh, for early talent to have an impact during COVID-19. There's every chance their manager is under way more pressure than they are in the work context. Uh, so how can they manage up well? How can they help take things off the manager's plate? How can they help make their manager's life just that little bit easier over these months? And then also to extend uh, and think about, well, if I've got some time and capacity on my hands, um, who could use that? Who could use my skills, my talents, my passions, my time and capacity? What other areas of my team? What other areas of the business? There's a bank in uh, the Asia Pacific region who has redeployed their entire early talent cohort into the call centers uh, to manage the help manage and respond to the increased volume of, of customer calls about money and mortgages and loans and business and all of that sort of stuff. So they've literally said, you know what, this entire cohort can extend. Let's move them over here. They're doing a short term deployment, three months on the phone. Uh, let's go. Uh, so there are ways, uh, there are ways and means of doing that. Um, at Development Beyond Learning, uh, before we uh, get into the, the questions, um, at Development Beyond Learning, we are ourselves looking at ways of pivoting and, and doing some things differently. Um, we have launched these sessions around the world. We launched them last week. These are live, free, early talent development sessions. They're 45 minutes each. They're free. It doesn't matter where your, uh, where your young person is based, their location, their sector, their background. Um, we've had over 500 registrations for these sessions um, this week. Um, the first UK run ran this morning. Uh, really, really great. I had more than 100, 100 people online. And we ran them in Singapore. We got them going in Australia and Europe. Uh, stay tuned for new dates. About 25 employers involved in these at the moment. Totally free, short live stream sessions uh, to help early career talent with some of these skills. Um, and get in touch with Kusha Pell, uh, kpell at developmentbeyondlearning.com for more information. Uh, and then next week, on Thursday, April 30, uh, we have our own employer virtual roundtable event around transitioning early talent into your organisation under COVID-19. Again, get in touch with Kusha next Thursday virtually with over 100 UK employers attending uh, already as well. Particular focus on transitioning early talent into your organisation from a development of behavioural science uh, kind of context. Um, so we are, we, are close to, uh, we are close to wrapping up there. Um, I'm going to just address um, Edward's uh, question around the behavioural science piece. And I think the simplest way to uh, answer that, uh, Edward, is in, in the return and reimagination and redesign of your development programs, uh, think about what choices uh, you are that redesign gives your early talent uh, to support themselves and on the things that matter. So we, in behavioural science, it's called choice architecture. Uh, so what, what is available uh, to them and what can you provide that will help nudge them uh, to put some of these skills uh, into, uh, into practice in their everyday life? And their environment has changed. This is a really important thing to address. Underpinning that as a framework uh, to, uh, I guess, help shape what, uh, what to focus on, it's best to focus on anything development-wise that can help them achieve um, or help them fulfill their three psychological needs. If you'd like to Google self-determination theory, uh, really, really useful model and something we use, a psychological model we use to underpin our, our development programs. In your development, anything that you can help to nudge and equip them uh, to help them um, fulfill their need for autonomy and take choice back in their life about what's going on and what they do is great. Autonomy is the first one. Competence uh, is the second one. And then connectedness or relatedness uh, is the third. So when you are returning at the return stage and the reimagine and redesign phase, lean into the behavioral science, lean into something like self-determination theory around autonomy, competence and connectedness. And that will help you spawn lots of ideas that you can deploy um, to, uh, to help nudge them in the right direction, help equip them, help set them up uh, with the skills uh, that they need. Um, 
Marina, is there are there other other questions in the in the forum? Uh, yes, so we have a comment and a question from Isabella. Uh, great advice on how to help our graduates adapt and thrive. Uh, what are your thoughts on how we can better support our business and enable our managers to coach early talent in this new environment? Fantastic. Thanks, Is thanks Isabella. This idea um, of manager engagement has always been important in early career talent uh, development. We released a, a lot of thought, sort of leadership and research and pieces content to the industry last, just before Christmas. And uh, I think what's super important to embrace now is it's more important than ever. You go back to 70, 2010, the 70 and the 20 are in the hands of the manager, right? The 70, the learning on the job, completely disrupted. Uh, the 20% with the manager or the coach, distracted out of sight, out of mind. So I understand where the, where the, uh, where the question is coming from. I think as we move it, as we are, if we're in the return stage um, or the reimagine stage, now more than ever, we've got to be including manager support, manager engagement as part of the strategy, uh, as part of the mix. If we're running virtual masterclasses for your early talent, be running virtual masterclasses for their managers as well. Advice, on what early on what young people need um, in uh, in this new world in this new uh, working environment some tools some toolkits that are simple and easy to use uh, for your managers to have really effective weekly one-on-one -on -one conversations that might only take 25 minutes and can be done really efficiently um, with a toolkit that maybe has some really pointed coaching questions that are relevant to the environment super useful for a busy manager who's under who's under, um, under pressure, um, and also making sure that they feel part of the return or the reimagine uh, or the redesign. They will have views on what the reimagination should look like. They're the ones managing them. Uh, so not to forget that, yes, they're pressured, um, and so are you, so is everyone, but to keep involving them um, in, in the conversation when we're at that return, reimagine, uh, and redesign stage, super, super important. But up front, let's be communicating, let's be um, equipping our managers as we will need to, as, as we need to with our early talent uh, themselves. Advice, simple toolkits that are easy to use, uh, that can make conversations and support efficient and stress-free uh, is, is an easy, easy way to go in this initial kind of three to five months um, phase. Fantastic. Uh, any, thank you, Josh. Any other questions there, Marina, or shall we wrap it up? I believe that's it. Yes. Thank you, Josh. And thank you, uh, Gemma and Anna, for a really useful session. Um, if you missed the start of uh, the webinar, we record all our webinars. So this session will be available on our website by the end of the day. And feel free to pass it along to your colleagues who might be interested. Again, thanks, everyone. Uh, Thank you for joining us today and stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.